Vor der Kaserne, vor dem großen Tor, stand eine Laterne und steht sie noch davor. So wollen wir uns da wieder sehen, bei der Laterne wollen wir stehen, wie einst Lili Marlene, wie einst Lili Marlene. Beiden Schatten sahen wie einer aus, dass wir so lieb und passen, das sah man gleich darauf. Alle Leute sollen sehen, wenn wir bei der Laterne stehen, wie einst Lili Marlene, wie einst Lili Marlene. Es kann drei Tage kosten, Kamerad, ich komm so gleich. Da sagten sie auf Wiedersehen, wie gerne möchte ich mit dir gehen. Mit dir, Lili Marlene, mit dir, Lili Marlene. Hey everybody, welcome back to Submarine History with me, your host, Haiku. Today we're going to be talking about the snorkel, what it was, and how it affected U-boat operations in the last year of the war. We'll be talking for a bit about the events leading up to the implementation of the snorkel, its theory, and then towards the end of the briefing there will be some nice pictures, uh, and I have a table and a chart that are going to help us understand how effective the snorkel actually was. Special thanks today, uh, shout out to Aaron S. Hamilton and the book he wrote, Total Undersea War, The Evolutionary Role of the Snorkel in Donitz's U-Boat Fleet, 1944 to 1945. Hamilton's book is an excellent source of information on the subject of the snorkel. And I've been lucky enough to have some communication with Mr. Hamilton uh, about his book and about the subject of the snorkel in general. He's a great guy. Uh, he has a passion for history, and he really has an eye for technical detail. His book is a must-have for anyone's submarine library. All right, so let's get with this. And our references for today, there's a number of them. Feel free to stop the presentation if you want to uh, study the slides. I have withdrawn from the North Atlantic to the area west of the Azores in the hope of encountering less air reconnaissance there. That statement is from the Commander-in-Chief Navy, Carl Donitz, minutes of the conference of the Commander-in-Chief Navy with the Fuhrer on May 31st, 1943, at the Berghoff. Black May. In May 1943, Germany lost 43 U-boats versus 58 Allied ships lost. This was a high water mark in terms of losses uh, incurred by the Kriegsmarine uh, and, the, and its U-boats. In response, Donuts recalls his boats from the North Atlantic towards the end of May, and he re redirects them to other less hazardous ocean areas as BDU tries to find solutions to the problem of U-boat losses and the Allied convoy system. Challenges uh, facing U-boats from the Allies in the spring of 1943. This is as we understand it. The British have cracked the Enigma M4 code machine and they did that around November 1942. The British are introducing new, more effective generations of sonar, radar, and radio direction finders. The British are aggressively using operational research and wargaming to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of the convoy system. With the German surface uh, naval threat largely eliminated by 1943, Experienced British officers and sailors are transferring to anti-submarine warfare because that's where the action is at. And then finally, Germany's in a training death spiral. So here, are the, so these are the same challenges uh, as BDU understands them. The, 
The majority of U-boats being sunk are by aircraft during travel time to and from the patrol grid while traveling surfaced, day or night. Large amounts of radio traffic between U-boats and BDU are being intercepted by the Allies, allowing them to avoid U-boat concentrations. Night surface attacks, originally intended to avoid detection by sonar, are now difficult due to improved Allied surface search radar and radio direction finding. Finally, the Allied convoy defenses are too strong to per permit effective, sustained attacks. In BDU's idea on how to confront these challenges, U-boats must remain submerged as much as possible. U-boat submergence time must be maximized. Communication between U-boats and BDU must be kept to an absolute minimum. U-boats should attack from the submerged position through listening only if possible. U-boats have to continue to operate against convoys but they also should conduct operations in the coastal waters of the enemy. And finally, a high underwater speed is paramount to gain a favorable attack position and to escape Allied escorts after attack. So enter stage right. Helmuth Walter, a German engineer who worked at the Germania Works shipyard in Kiel, he developed the idea of a closed circuit propulsion system what we call Air Independent Propulsion, or AIP, in 1933. His vision was a U-boat with high underwater speed that could maintain pace with the surface fleet. Now, as part of his U-boat design, an air mast would be provided that would allow the U-boat to remain submerged where its hydrodynamic shape would have a speed advantage. At the end of 1933, the Reichsmarine approved a design study of the Walter U-boat with its AIP, however, without an air mast for underwater travel. Again, this is back in 1933. Around that time, uh, Walter was developing his ideas for a high-speed AIP U-boat with air mast. Uh, Lieut Lieutenant Commander Jan J. Wishers of the Royal Netherlands Navy actually obtained a patent for an extensible air mass to facilitate the use of diesel engines uh, when submerged. Uh, air mass were developed and installed uh, in the Dutch submarines 019 through 027. Now, uh, when the Netherlands falls, their submarines wind up in the hands of the British and they also wind up in the hands of the German. And the air mass that were on these Dutch subs actually end up being removed by the British and the Germans. Okay, so this is like around, you know, 1940. Um, it was felt that the North Atlantic was too rough to make the devices useful for anything other than providing fresh air in rough seas while surfaced. Now, things change in March 1943 when, uh, during a meeting between Walter and Donuts to discuss the development of the Walter U-boat, Walter brings up the subject of the snorkel. Um, Donuts is intrigued by the idea of U-boats traveling underwater for extended periods using a snorkel where the Allied use of radar would be inhibited. And here it is, the snorkel also known in German as the uh, Schnorschel. So this is the theory of snorkel operation. We're gonna use a vertical pipe to continuously draw fresh air into the interior of a U-boat while it's moving at periscope depth. We will use the interior volume of the U-boat to act as an air reservoir to supply air to the diesel engines while that volume of air is continually replenished through the vertical pipe. The idea is that we're going to bring more air into the boat than we're going to send out of the boat through the engine system. And we will use a control valve to temporarily close the air intake pipe when waves submerge it. So these were the advantages that the snorkel provided. A U-boat can theoretically remain submerged for the entirety of its war patrol. The radar cross-section of the snorkel is minuscule compared to a surfaced U-boat. 
and the use of radar absorbing materials on the snorkel can further reduce the radar cross section. Batteries can be charged while snorkeling, ensuring ready batteries for combat situations. Because the U-boat is submerged for long periods of time, radio transmissions are kept to a minimum, further reducing detection by allied RDF systems. The snorkel works best uh, when it's used at night, followed by submerged travel on batteries during the day. And this greatly increases our survivability traveling to and from the patrol grid. So what were the, um, the disadvantages of the snorkel? And there, and there were disadvantages. Um, operating submerged for prolonged periods of time can induce additional physical and psychological strain on U-boat crews. Carbon monoxide buildup within the boat is a potential issue. Even though the radar cross-section of the snorkel is small, it still has a radar cross-section, and a radar detection system must be mounted on the snorkel for early warning. While batteries can be charged when snorkeling, Hydrogen gas buildup within the boat is also a potential issue. Limited radio contact with BDU and other U-boats makes the wolf pack tactic difficult to accomplish. And this also creates difficulties in BDU tracking U-boats and relaying mission changes. Generally speaking, uh, underwater speed is limited to less than seven knots while using the snorkel. Uh, this makes tracking and engaging targets difficult. This also slightly increases travel time to and from the patrol grid. Targets are attacked from a submerged position now, which is less effective than from the surface. Finally, periods of time greater than one minute with the snorkel air intake valve closed can create a vacuum inside the boat, potentially injuring the crew. So Donuts, uh, he green lights the snorkel project at the, at the end of May 1943. Um, the fall of 1943 is spent designing the snorkel, testing prototypes uh, on Type 2 boats and a couple Type 7 boats, and settling on final designs. Snorkel installation for the Type 7 and Type 9 U-boats uh, begins in the winter of 1943-1944, and installation of snorkels begins in earnest in the summer of 1944. And initially, Snorkel adoption is resisted by elements within the naval design community and by the U-boat crews themselves. However, um, as crews get experience operating the snorkel, attitudes do change, and the snorkel is eventually embraced by uh, the U-boat crews. Eventually, 353 U-boats uh, would be fitted with snorkels by the end of the war. Okay, so now we're in the part of the briefing where we're going to look at uh, we're going to look at some pictures. And uh, this first picture here is a really nice representation to show you how this snorkel uh, works. Uh, and you can see on the bottom that the, the, snorkel, the snorkel itself is like in a recessed well on the deck. It would be raised up. Uh, when it's in the fully upright position, it's riding at about the same height as the periscope. And uh, above, you can see the the uh, air intake control valve, which is a ball valve. So when water hits it, uh, it's lighter than water and it closes the valve preventing water from getting down into the boat. Now the Type 7 and Type 9 boats were never designed for snorkels. So it was a, it was a challenge to figure out a way to retrofit these boats uh, for the snorkel. And they did it a couple ways. They, they end up coming up with two types of snorkels. There's the type one, which is what we're going to be looking at here in the next series of slides. Uh, on this slide, this is where the exhaust gas from the engine room would be connected to the snorkel piping. And here you can see as the snorkel is raised, the flanges are going to meet and that's going to create a seal. And then that's in the fully upright position. So there's actually two pipes. Uh, one pipe is drawing air into the interior of the boat, and then the other pipe is carrying the exhaust uh, gas from the diesel engines, and also things like, you know, you're venting now your hydrogen gas through here as well. Um, and there's a diffuser at the top of the pipe, and the exhaust was actually discharged be right below the surface uh, of the water. And that was to prevent one from smoke from being visible, 
and two, uh, it eliminated any like heat signature. And here you can see on this photo, this is, um, you know, this, this is a boat riding at periscope depth and, you know, this is what the snorkel looks like. We have a very calm sea, so this is a, these are very favorable conditions for the snorkel. Um, towards the end of the war, they, were, they would make some improvements to the uh, snorkel. And in this picture, you can see there's actually a shroud uh, around the snorkel piping, piping, excuse me, and that will also go around the periscope. Uh, and this has this shroud has a hydrodynamic shape to reduce drag. And this actually enabled U-boats to achieve speeds uh, up to 11 knots. Okay, um, here is a table from uh, the OEG report number 51, Anti-Submarine Warfare in World War II, Operations Evaluation Group, Office of the Chief of Naval Operations, Navy Department, 1946. So this table is actually from, uh, American, uh, from an American naval document. Um, what we did after the war, we actually, um, we actually created mock-ups of snorkels and just put them, put them on the water. Uh, and the point was to see how effective radar was in actually detecting the snorkel. Uh, and reading, reading this report, I believe, and if I understand it cor correctly, literally what they did is, is they put a mock-up of a snorkel head on the ocean uh, in a stationary position that was known. And then they just had planes fly back and forth seeing how often they could pick up the snorkel. Uh, we have two columns. The column on the left, that's the ANAPS-15 uh, radar. That's a three centimeter operating in the X-band. And the column to the right, um, ASG. I haven't actually been able to find out what that, what that stands for, but I think it's, I think it's to, it's kind of like the British um, ASV Mark III. Airborne surface search radar, I think, uh, but it's a 10 centimeter radar operating in the S band. And we'll just go through this. Average range on surface sub, your detection with the 3 centimeter radar is from 32, so you can detect from 32 miles out. With the 10 centimeter, you detect the surface submarine 19 miles out. The average detection range on the snorkel. With the three centimeter radar, you're picking it up at 10 and a half miles. Uh, with the 10 centimeter radar, you're picking up at 4.1 miles. And then the percentage run on which contact is made with the snorkel uh, in sea states one and two, 82% 80, of the time you're picking it up with the three centimeter radar and 67% of the time you're picking it up with the 10 centimeter radar. For sea states three and four, you're picking up that snorkel 55% of the time with the three centimeter radar and 32% of the time with the 10 centimeter radar. So that's, those are, those are numbers that you can't ignore. Um, and as I said, keep in mind for this, for this trial that they did, the snorkel head was set in a known location. So the planes know where to go. Um, in a real world situation where there's a boat someplace on the ocean, your your chances of picking up that snorkel are going are going to go down. And then finally here, this is a uh, chart I've been working on for a while uh, using the information over at uh, uboat.net. But on this chart, we've got three lines. Uh, the gray line is the number of U-boats on patrol in a given month, the average number. The blue line uh, are the number of allied ships lost during that month. And then the lowest line, the yellow line, that's the number of U-boats lost in a given month. And in putting together this table, I only included U-boats that were known to be sunk either by air or surface assets. So boats that are destroyed in port are not included. Uh, boats that are, mi are missing, um, not included boats involved in accidents that resulted in them sinking, not included. 
Um, and accidents could be anything from hitting another ship to hitting a mine. But what I want to, what, 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 on this chart, what I want to call your attention to is this red box. You can see it starts at June 1944 and it continues to April, the end of April 1945. And we can see here from the months of June to November 1944, um, the number of boats on patrol is pretty steady and the number of u-boats being sunk is going down it is going down and it actually kind of reaches a steady state condition in october which kind of carries uh into into december 1944 and it's really kind of hard to look at the months of march and april because there, there was just so much so much going against the German Navy in, in terms of what the Allies were doing and in terms of like the quality of the crews that uh, they were putting on boats that um, it's really kind of hard to make really any any sense out of the last two months of the war. But for sure, we can see that between June 44 and uh, January 45, something is happening that's making it possible for U-boat losses to go down while the number of U-boats on patrol um, is going up. So you can make it, I mean, you can make a case that the snorkel made a difference. Um, the other thing about this chart is that by this, you know, by the spring of 1944, Donuts, yeah, he, he threw in the towel on, on, on convoy attacks. Um, it's just with just with every with just with the state of everything that it was, it just it just wasn't it just wasn't a viable option anymore. So what we're seeing here uh, between June forty four and the end of the war, um, you know, we're seeing boats on solid on solitary patrols, and they're going they're doing things like they're going to the coastal waters of. Um, of Britain and you know they're engaging in attacks of of opportunity the type nines um, are going are still going back out to the eastern seaboard but they're doing the same thing I mean they're doing things like going up in the St. Lawrence Seaway um, staying very close in coastal waters at uh, you know staging themselves at locations where you know shipping is going to be leaving port so you know that's that's ultimately that's what it came down to. That's how they had to fight the war with the U-boats to have any to have any possibility of, of keeping those boats in service. So our conclusions: um, the snorkel fundamentally changed the way Germany employed its U-boats starting in June 1944. U-boats no longer sail the surface of the ocean or terrorize merchant convoys with bold surface attacks at night, followed by wolf packs controlled real time by BDU. U-boats now fight and survive by staying hidden and operating independently in enemy coastal waters waiting for targets of opportunity. Operating in this fashion did increase the survivability of the U-boats and required the Allies to continue to, to divert resources to anti-submarine warfare. However, U-boats uh, are not able to mass and attack large concentrations of merchant ships. They alone can no longer influence the war. So. This marks perhaps, you know, the change in the role of submarine in general as a weapon of pla as a weapons platform, uh, and you know you can make a case that now they are the choice for naval reconnaissance, special operations, and attacks on select high value individual targets. Now, talking about this, we're setting aside the whole issue of nuclear propulsion in submarines. Because that's, because that's its own game uh, in and of itself. These things that we've talked about, these conclusions, and this idea of how these submarines should operate into the future, this is all based on diesel electric technology. And that's it for today, everyone. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the briefing and we'll come back again. Feel free to contact me via email. I am on Discord, Twitter, and I do have a Patreon. Thanks to USNI for doing the job they do so well. Their publishing arm is an invaluable resource to the preservation of naval history. Consider becoming a member so their work can continue long into the future. Till next time, 
Peace out.